All right. Uh, good morning. This is uh, still lecture in chapter 11. Okay, and just a brief, brief review on the last lecture. Last lecture we spent lengthy time deriving equations. Okay, the objective of that equation is the development of generic equation that can be used for any kind of problems, and we don't have to worry about shell anymore. Okay, and at the end of the last lecture, we come up with this equation, and I said this is a special equation which has some restriction. Okay, first, it is applicable. This is equation of balance for internal energy only. Okay, it does not involve kinetic energy. It does not involve potential energy. So it is proper for the system that has the change in temperature. Okay, if the system is isothermal, this equation is not proper for such system. Secondly, this equation was developed under assumption that the density of the liquid or fluid is constant. Okay, and also it was assumed that the viscosity of the fluid is constant. Therefore, this is usable for Newtonian fluid only. And on the left-hand side, this is like a convection term. On the right-hand side, the first term is conduction, represented by Fourier law. And then this one is called the dissipation function, or the term associated with viscous heat. And a little bit more about this substantial derivative. We found, or we discussed that from chapter three, that substantial derivative is basically partial derivative added by this term, V dot del. So therefore, if we have dt by d time, it's supposed to be partial differentiation of temperature with respect to time added by V dot del t, okay? And for today, I'm going to show you examples how to use this equation in various, um, various situations, all right? The first one that we want to do would be the repetition or repetition of the example that we already did using shear balance. This is a forced convection flow in a circular pipe. You have fluid or liquid flowing, and in this particular problem, I'm going to say it is heated. So you have cold water coming in, heat the pipe, and at the end, you have hot water coming out. Okay? And we already discussed that this kind of problem contains two transport phenomena at the same time. There's a momentum balance, there's a flow, so therefore there must be a momentum balance, and there's a heat heating, so therefore there must be energy balance. Okay? We discussed during the time in chapter 10 that in this particular problem, convection is dominating, so therefore we, can't, we cannot neglect convection from energy transport. And on the other hand, we can assume that density and viscosity does not change significantly with temperature. So we will assume density, and density will be constant, viscosity to be constant, and go ahead and do momentum balance first, okay? And if you do that, it would be the same as finding velocity profile of isothermal system, or the flow in the isothermal system, and you end up with this velocity profile just as what we did in chapter two, okay? Now, next step is to use equation of energy to find en temperature profile within the system. And I'm going to use this equation and try to write the equation for cylindrical coordinate, okay? And if you don't have to remember the form of this equation any, any anymore. Actually, it was written in the appendix. You can just look it up. So for this equation, if I write it down for cylindrical coordinate, I'm going to get this following.
All right. It is really long equation. Okay. This is the longest equation in the course. The equation for energy balance or equation of energy is really, really long. Um, this part on this board is basically this equation. Okay. If you take a look closely, this is substantial derivative, which is which can be split into partial derivative with respect to time and v dot del t. v dot del t means you have v components of all directions multiplied by time component, but this is not, not time component, temperature component, but this is del t, which would be differentiation of temperature. So we have temperature differentiated with respect to R, Z, and Z. So this part, the whole thing is substantial derivative of temperature with respect to time. The first term on the right-hand side, that's Fourier law, that's K times del square, which is second order differentiation with respect to R, Z, and Z. So you have three terms over here, and then the dissipation function. And dissipation function by itself needs another board. This is the whole thing about dissipation function, okay? And you see that it has something very, very similar to Newton's law in the sense that you have differentiation with one, like differentiation with R by Z and then plus Vz by R. This is exactly like in New Newton's law. Also, th this term 2 over 3 with something like this. So keep in mind that this dissipation function was developed using Newton's law, plug it in into the term of workflow, okay? So in order to use that, um, you have to just write down equations and do the same trick. Just remove the term, terms that are zero. In this case, if we write it down, we know that at this point, VR is zero, V is zero, Vz is function of R only, and in this case, temperature would be function of R and Z. Oh, maybe write it down here. Temperature would be function of R and Z. All right, now let's start. The first term, the steady state term that can be dropped, right? Vr is equal to zero, V is zero, Vc is not zero, temperature is function of Z, so this term must be kept. So let me highlight using this blue ink, this term will be kept. Okay? On the right hand side, you have temperature with respect to R, temperature in our case depending on R, so this term must be kept, it's not zero. So let's highlight this term. T with respect to theta, the whole thing here turns to be zero. According to the symmetry around the circumference, we know that temperature will be uniform in any angle. Temperature on the other hand depends on the length of the pipe, the longer the pipe, the higher the temperature would be because you heat it for a very long time. So in this case, temperature depends on Z. You must keep this part. For dissipation function, actually you need the whole equation over there plugged in here, but of course the board is too short. We have to split into two parts. This part, if you slowly going through each term, VR, zero, V zeta, zero, we are here zero. Vz, this Vz is not zero, but it is not function of Z. Vz is function of R only. So differentiation of this term turns to be zero. Zeta is zero. Vr is zero. Vz is not function of zeta. According to symmetry, it turns to be zero. V zeta is zero. Vr is zero. All right? But this term, v, Vz, is a function of R, so you need to keep this term, okay? And then, this term, Vi is zero, Vz is zero, Vz is not function of Z, the whole term here is zero. So even though the equation is very, very long, normally, it would be reduced to only a couple of terms, maybe one or two terms, okay? In this case, we have only one term. So, 
you would put a lot of effort writing the equations, but when you eliminate them, you see that it's not that bad. Okay? So from here, if I write equation, I would get rho CP times VZ dt by dz, which is this term, equal to, on the right-hand side, k, 1 over r, d by dr, r, dt by dr, plus differentiation on the second order of temperature with respect to z, plus mu here. And then dissipation function, I have only one term left. That would be dvz by dr squared. OK? And if you compare what we have here to the equation that we got from doing shear balance, you see that during that time, we got this term. We got this term, we got this term. The only term that is different is this term. During that time, we said that this is basically the conduction in z directions. Okay? Remember that we discussed if we have cold water coming in, you heat it up, the temperature here would be higher than the inlet temperature. This would be low temperature. Okay? So that means if you consider cons Conduction flux. Conduction would always go from high temperature to low temperature. Conduction flux should go up. This is conduction flux in z direction going up from high temperature to low temperature. On the other hand, convective flux. Convective flux is supposed to go down according to the flow, so convective flux is going down. And according to the comparison, we, we, we will always know that convection is more important. It will win this battle. So we said that this one would be approximately negligible. So if we neglect that, this term, which is relating to conduction in z direction, is supposed to be dropped. So during the time in chapter 10, we dropped this term before solving it, or before getting everything into the same equation. We dropped it first. That's why we don't have this term during that time. But if you start with generic equation, every term will be shown, and you have to drop them after you get the equation. Okay? As a result, it will be the same thing. On the other hand, this term, which is viscous heat, we got that in chapter 10, and we discussed that this term would be negligible if the viscosity is not too fast or the, vis uh, the vis viscosity is not too large or the velocity is not too fast. So this term will be viscosity, will be dropped, and then we end up with these two terms. And I said that we have convection going in, and then conduction going out in our direction. Okay? So everything else, the rest of this, how to solve this equation will be the same as what we discussed previously. All right? So next equation, or next example, would be a little bit more simpler.
All right. This example is modification of the very first example that we learned. It is actually the flow of liquid on the inclined plane. This is the very first example that we learned in momentum session. Okay? And we already, during that time, we already discussed the profile of this one already. And we analyzed the velocity components that Vx is zero, Vy is zero. And Vz is not zero because z axis is going along the direction of the flow and obviously does not become zero. And if you analyze it further, you see that velocity up here is non zero, but velocity at the interface will become zero. So Vz will be a function of x for sure. And it, it's not a function of z if you ignore acceleration. All right? This problem, however, it is modified a little bit further. So if the temperature of the solid plate is T delta and temperature of the air up here is T zero, suppose you have somehow a means to control the temperature to remain constant. If the surface here is heated constantly so that temperature is T delta and air up here is constantly cool so that temperature will be T zero. Okay, the further twist is that at high temperature here, viscosity of the fluid would be changed if viscosity here is mu delta and viscosity here is mu zero. Now my fluid is no longer, does not have constant viscosity anymore. Now viscosity is function of temperature. If it is said that viscosity can be calculated by this equation, exponential, exponential uh, relationship between temperature, inverse of temperature, and viscosity. So the higher the temperature, the lower the viscosity according to this um, maybe empirical e equation. All right. What should we do? Now you have to understand that in this problem, we have flow. So therefore, there, might be, there must be momentum balance. There's a temperature difference. The system is non-isothermal, so there must be energy balance. Which one should be done first? OK? On one hand, you see that temperature affects the flow, for sure. That means without knowing temperature, you will not know the viscosity. So you need temperature profile before calculating temp uh, velocity profile. On the other hand, you, you might also see that there's a flow here. This flow should carry energy. So there must be convection of energy along Z axis. Without knowing velocity, you will not know how to calculate convective tr energy transport term. So how do we start? Which one should we use first? Now, if you think more closely, you see that in this problem, we also have mass transport. But this is overall mass transport in the sense that we have only single species. So if you think plainly, you, you see that we can do mass balance as well. So you can have overall mass balance, input mass going in, input mass, uh, output mass going out. So if you think that mass would always conserve, and we can start with mass balance, the equation representing mass balance is basically equation of continuity. So if I start with equation of continuity, I get this part. What can we get from equation of continuity? First, steady state, Vx is zero, Vy is zero. If we Somehow assume, we need to assume at this point 
that density is constant. Of course, when you have temperature change, right now problems state clearly that viscosity is changing with respect to temperature. Does it mean the density must be changed as well? Yes, in, in detail it will change, but you can look into the uh, real experimental data that you, you see that some substance significantly follows, I mean, the, the viscosity change significantly with respect to temperature, but density does not change that much. For instance, if you consider honey, when you heat up honey a little bit, viscosity change dramatically, but density is still roughly the same. Okay? So in this case, we will make approximation that density is approximately the same. So therefore, we can take this density out, and whatever we have left would be dvz by dz equal to zero. And you might say that we already knew that because according to this an analysis, this comply with our assumption well. So, of course, if we, we say that no acceleration, we neglect acceleration, velocity does not change with, res with respect to z, that's confirmed, okay? So we don't get much from mass balance. That's okay. What about energy balance or comparing between energy balance or the momentum balance, which one should be done first? Now, you might argue that either way seems like there's no beginning. You cannot start with energy. You cannot start with momentum either. Let's start with one, okay? In this case, I'm going to start with momentum. Why? Somehow, if I think, if I assume that density does not change very much, okay? In that case, the only thing changed with respect to temperature is viscosity. If I can write equation relating viscosity to the momentum balance, in that case, I can somehow solve this one under assumption, all right? However, we cannot use Navier-Stokes equation anymore. If you recall, Navier-Stokes equation is equation for momentum balance under assumption of constant viscosity. And I have to emphasize that the word constant here means constant with respect to time and constant with respect to position in the system as well. In this case, obviously, viscosity is not constant with respect to position. Different position in our system changes the vis viscosity. So you cannot use Navier-Stokes equation. Instead, you have to go back to the original equation of motion, which for Cartesian coordinate looks like this. Of course, equation of motion, there will be x component, y component, and z component. In this case, we will just write down z component because we only have z momentum going down, okay? If we have z momentum, x momentum balance or y momentum balance will not give you much information. You can do that and you see that it does not give you anything. So for z momentum balance, the equation looks like this. On the right hand side, on the left hand side, it looks exactly the same as in Navier-Stokes equation. On the right, you cannot use Newton law anymore. So you have to keep it as shear stress. So this one would be tau xz with respect to x. Remember, tau xz, you have the second subscript to be z. This one is z momentum transferring in x direction. We only have z momentum because velocity component that is non-zero is z velocity in z, z component. So all tau is supposed to have second subscript to be z. 
So this is tau yz with respect to y and tau zz with respect to z. And then external force, rho gz. All right, this is called equation of motion. If, we, if you recall in chapter three, we developed this equation first and then we replace tau, each tau by a Newton law so that we can change the right hand side part into velocity. But in this case, we cannot use Newton law anymore because viscosity is not constant. So we have to step back here. Now, if you consider steady state assumption, that term will be gone. There's no Vx, there's no Vy, and Vz is not function of z according to what we found from equation of continuity or according to what we analyzed earlier. Pressure, in this case, you have to recall the, f the first examples that pressure is not a function of z. If you say pressure here is atmospheric, pressure down here, if you go down, Pressure is something because of the heat of liquid on top of this point. Of course, if you go along z-axis, this is also atmospheric. If you go down with the same distance, this pressure remains the same because the heat here and the heat over there are the same. So pressure is not function of z. You can drop this term. Then tau. How can we drop tau? Earlier in momentum session, you can drop tau according to analysis by Newton law, but you cannot use Newton law here, so we have to look at the physical meanings of the tau. Tau xz, that's z momentum transferring in x direction, that's not zero. Tau yz, that's z momentum transferring in y. Transferring in y, that means there must be velocity change in y direction as a driving force. There's no driving force in there, I wrote that picture two-dimensionally, so we did not consider y at all. This term must be zero. Tau zz, tau zz is z momentum transferring in z direction. In order to get transfer in z direction, there must be velocity gradient in z direction. That means velocity in z direction must also change with z direction as well. In other words, there must be acceleration somehow in z direction. And we stated earlier, it does not. So this term turns to be zero. So at the end, we have only two terms, tau and rho g. Okay? So let me highlight the term that are not zero. And we will deal with that later. For equation of energy, Up to this point, it's okay. We can start with motion first and energy later, or you can start with energy first and motion later because we have not solved them yet. Theoretically, you have to solve them simultaneously. So let's start with writing equation and see how it goes, okay? For equation of energy, this is the equation in vector form. If I write down in Cartesian coordinate, this is scalar equation, so I only have one single equation, unlike equation of motion, which is vector equation. There are three components associated with equation of motion. This, I have only one.
All right, uh, because I'm lazy, I do not want to write down the lengthy equation for dissipation function. We will deal with that later, okay? So this is equation of energy, and we can start eliminating terms that are zero. Steady state term that will be dropped. Vx is zero, Vy is zero, Vz is not zero, and temperature is function of Z, so this term must be kept. All right, this term must be kept. On the right-hand side, temperature is function of x. For sure, we can see that at x equal to 0 is one temperature. At x equal to delta, that's another temperature. So temperature is function of x. So if we write it down here, temperature will be function of x and z. So therefore, this term must be kept. Of course, this term must be kept as well. And T is not function of Y, this term can be dropped. And as I said earlier, I'm a little bit lazy. You can, you can write the equation for dissipation function and eliminate term according to velocity, which velocity component is zero, which one is not. And you see that at the end, this dissipation function would be dvz by dx square. This is only term left that is not zero. But you can say it from the very beginning that the whole term here is associated with viscous heat. This is viscous heat. And if the velocity is not so fast or the viscosity is not so high, this viscous heat can be neglected from the very beginning. You don't need to deal with everything inside anymore. Okay? So I'm going to say that viscous heat is negligible. In this case, we only have three terms, okay? We don't have to deal with that. This term is negligible. All right? So from equation of energy, you have this convective transport term And, convection, uh, and conduction on the right-hand side in two directions. So now we have this equation from energy balance. And if I replace this, from momentum balance, you get zero equal to this would be equation from momentum balance and we know that gz here is G cosine beta, okay? So this would be equation from momentum balance. So we have two equations that must be solved simultaneously, but we cannot solve them simultaneously because of complexity of the equation. So we have to start somewhere. How? In this case, I'm going to start with equation of energy. I'm going to start with energy first instead of velocity. Why? Let me erase this so that we can start. If I want to start with equation of energy, okay, I have to make some kind of assumption. So first of all, we have three terms, and temperature is function of x and z, 
So the equation is partial differentiation. So in order to solve this one, it's very, very complicated. Either you use numerical technique, or you have to make assumption to eliminate terms so that they are simpler, OK? According to physical meanings, you can say this one is convection in z direction. That means it's energy carrying down the inclined plane with the flow of liquid. These two terms, this is conduction, is conduction in x direction and conduction in z direction. If you take a look at the picture, conduction in x direction means suppose you have high temperature over here down on the surface, low temperature on the air, there must be conduction going in x direction. Conduction in z direction means going down is in this direction, if you look at the fluid at the middle of the layer, if the fluid is cold at the very beginning, it is heating up. So at the end here, temperature of the fluid is supposed to be higher than entering fluid. So high temperature here, low temperature over there, conduction in fluid is supposed to go up. All right? And you may think that I would say conduction in z direction is not as important as convection in z direction. I can say, right, you can assume that and neglect this term. Just like what we did in force convection, now we have two terms. Okay, should we solve it right away? Still, still very difficult. Why? This one is a little bit different because temperature is still a function of two variables. All right? So I'm going to somehow modify this one a little bit more. How? If you look at the picture, if the temperature on the surface here is T delta everywhere, and temperature on, t on the air here is T0 everywhere, you see that suppose I have liquid at some temperature, cold temperature entering here. If the thickness of this film is really, really small, if it is really small, the gradient, there will be a temperature difference here, the gradient at this entering region would change very, very quickly toward the end. On the other, in the other words, I can say that if the thickness of the foam is really thin, then the difference in temperature, or what we call temperature gradient, in x direction would be significantly large. Following, thing again, okay? Suppose I have temperature entering here, T1, okay? Is T1 here? Is C1 over there? If I heat it up using T delta, if this is hot plate, the temperature at the end, the highest temperature possible, would be T delta here at the surface for sure, according to the boundary condition. At the air here, there must be T0. In the middle here, temperature must be in between. It does not go higher than T delta. It does not go lower than T0. It must be something in between, right? And you see that as the foam becomes thinner, if I analyze the temperature at this point, this is T0, this is T delta, temperature in my fluid would be something in between. The question is, can you see that the gradient of temperature at this location and gradient of temperature at that location should not change much if the film is thin? Why? Because the film is so thin, the temperature gradient change at the very beginning only, the rest, it will stay the same. In other words, I can say that the temperature adjusts itself so quickly, it does not affect at the end of the stream anymore. So therefore, in other words, the flow does not change temperature profile that much. The temperature profile was the result 
from difference in this pair of temperature, or it is affected by conduction in x direction mainly. So in that case, I would say that this term is much more important than convection term, and I'm going to drop this part. All right? So in that case, from partial differential equation, I can reduce it into t ordinary differentiation d squared t by dx squared equal to zero. Simple equation, which can be integrated twice to get linear temperature profile. What does it mean, this linear temperature profile? Let's go back to this picture again. It means that if I plot temperature here, this is T delta, If I plot temperature profile, this is T0, this is T delta, temperature in between becomes linear. Okay, this is linear temperature profile. If you repeat the calculation or repeat the graph, if you try to find the graph over here, this is T delta, this is T0, in between this is linear temperature profile. So it means that under this assumption, temperature profile at the entering region and temperature profile at the outlet of the flow region here does not change much. It stay remains the same. The only, the only time or the only region that have nonlinear temperature profile is this region where liquid is initially heated up. Afterward, the temperature is controlled by temperature of the plate and temperature of the air. So therefore, since the temperature of these two plates are fixed, temperature of the liquid in, in the middle remains almost the same everywhere. That's the explanation from that equation. Okay? So we can say this region that has nonlinear temperature profile, we can ignore that part and we analyze only this part and assume that temperature profile is linear everywhere. Okay, and that's the explanation of this equation. Now, in order to solve this one, we need two boundary conditions. First, at x equal to zero, temperature is T zero. So that means you have T zero over here, zero over there, or C two equal to T zero. And then another boundary condition is at x equal to delta, T equal to T delta. Now you have T delta equal to C1 times X, which is delta, plus C2, which is T0 already. So you can solve for C1. You get C1 equal to T delta subtracted by T0 over delta. Okay? So in this case, you plug C1 and C2 back in the original equation. Rearrange the equation a little bit, you end up with this temperature profile. All right. Now you can see that I can get this answer for temperature profile without considering flow at all. Why? Because I ignore this term completely. I ignore that convective term is not as important as conduction in x direction. So I don't have to care about finding velocity profile at this point. In other words, in this problem, I start with energy calculation, okay, under some certain assumption. So I get linear temperature profile, and then I can solve momentum equation for velocity profile. Okay, so let's go back to momentum. We have this equation set up.
If I rearrange this equation, I know that flux is function of x only. So I can write it down as total differentiation equal to rho g cosine beta. If I integrate the equation, I get this flux to be rho gx cosine beta plus a constant. To find, to find a constant, I need boundary condition. And the boundary condition relating to the flux is at air interface. And we discussed this in the first example of chapter two. That the flux itself can have a meanings of momentum transport. This is Z momentum transferring in X direction. And transfer of momentum means one group of the liquid transfer momentum to another group, make another group flow, all right? So the continuously transferring makes the whole liquid flow. On the other hand, liquid does not mix air on top flows. The air on top of the liquid does not flow with the liquid. So we can say or we can imply that there is no transferring of the momentum from liquid to air. So in that case, mathematically, I can say that at x equal to zero, which is air liquid interface, tau xz is zero. There is no transferring across the boundary. So if you plug that into the equation, you end up with C1 equal to zero, okay? So if you recall, this is exactly the same as we did using shear balance in chapter two for these problems regarding, regardless of whether we have temperature profile or not. For the next, how can we plug this or how can we convert this tau into velocity? Earlier, we used Newton law. And for Newton law, you can get tau xz equal to minus mu dvz by dx. All right? If I plug this here, I get minus mu dvz by dx equal to rho gx cosine beta. C1 is zero already. And I can replace this mu using the given empirical equation. So I get minus a e to the power of b over t dvz by dx equal to rho gx cosine beta. Of course, you might argue, wait a minute, how can I use Newton law? From the very beginning, I said that we cannot use Navier-Stokes equation because the, the fluid is not Newton law, uh, the fluid is not Newtonian, or that means the viscosity is not constant within the system. Of course, you cannot use Newton law for sure. I mean, if you want to do correctly, you cannot use Newton law. You need some other expression to relate tau xz to velocity vz. In advanced transport phenomena, there might be such uh, empirical correlation. If you do have one, you use that one. If you do not, the only thing that we have in hand is Newton law. So I just want to, to show you that if you have this kind of correlation, plug it here, and then you can convert this mu to the given correlation, and then this one will be function of temperature, all right? In order to solve this one, if you integrate it once, you get one constant. In order to solve that, you need one boundary. The boundary condition would be at x equal to delta which is solid liquid interface, velocity component is zero. Okay, I'm not going to go into the detail because this temperature is a function of x according to this. So you need to bring everything here as a function of x onto exponential 
It's not on the exponential only, it's on the inverse ratio here, and you have to do the integration. So it is not straightforward task. I'm, I'm going to stop here because the rest is basically math. I'm not going to go through the math. This is not the math cost. All right? Okay, last example of the day. This is, uh, again, I'm not going to go through the math. This is just basic concept. I just want to use the example to show you how to do the calculation properly, okay? The example is a sphere. This highlight area is basically a shell, spherical shell of porous materials, okay? We have two coaxial sphere. One is smaller inside this, supposed to have the radius of KR, and the big one has the inner radius of capital R, okay? So the outer radius of the small one is KR, inner radius of the large one is R. So that means our system is in between, all right? So in this case, there'll be fluid, let's say air, flowing through this pipe into the inner cavity of the small shell. Inside this shell, there's a refrigeration coil making the temperature of the air drop. And when you have air going in, there must be air going out. Otherwise, your system would explode. Okay, so in this case, air would go through this spherical shell. Remember, this shell is porous. So the air itself can go through the shell and through another shell outside, going out. The point is, if the refrigeration shell or the refrigeration coil keep the temperature of this point of the outer position of the small shell to be TK. And temperature here is not as cold anymore. You have refrigeration only at this spot. So once the air expands going out, it starts to heat up somehow. It's not as cold as at this location anymore. If the temperature here is T1, we are interested in finding temperature profile of the air inside this cavity. <coughs> How do we do that? All right? 
So in this case, once again, we have flow. So there's momentum calculation, of course, and there's a, the temperature is changing, so the system is non-isothermal, so we need, we need to do calculation on energy as well. So two transport phenomena at the same time. How do we start? I told you that at this point, if you do not know how to start, please start with mass balance, all right? If you do the mass balance, which is equation of continuity, okay? Oh, before doing that, you need to analyze the flow components. In this case, we have spherical coordinates. This is the first time I show you spherical coordinate examples. In spherical coordinate, there are three velocity components, VR, V theta, V phi, okay? VR is velocity component from center outward. This is R direction, everywhere going in R direction. In this picture, you can see that I have velocity riding in R direction. In this case, VR is not equal to zero. V theta, if you imagine myself as a center of the Earth, this direction, this direction is theta. I'm, I'm sorry, this direction, vertical direction is theta. This direction on horizontal axis is phi. So if this component of velocity in theta, that means there must be a component going this way, okay? If there's velocity component in phi, there must be component going around this way. In this picture, there are none. So V theta is zero, V phi is zero, okay? If you analyze it further, this VR, which is not function, which is not zero, you have to analyze whether it is function of what? Is it function of r, phi, theta, or phi? Is this velocity changing with respect to r? So, that's, so that means as you go further from the center, do you observe the change in velocity? Of course, you should see that if you go further and further, linear velocity is supposed to go slower and slower. Why? because the area here is small. The area out here is large. If you think density of the air remains constant, mass flow rate is supposed to be constant, okay? Mass flow rate is constant means air entering this cavity is supposed to have the same mass flow rate as air going out according to mass balance. If I take the whole donut chip system here to be my system and I do the mass balance. So mass in supposed to equal to mass out at steady state. Actually it's supposed to be mass per time, rate of mass in and out. If I draw a picture of my donut, this is mass in, this is mass out. They must be the same according to mass balance, otherwise there, there have to be some accumulation or they cannot be a steady state. So if it is steady state, mass going in here and mass going out supposed to be equal. And mass going in and out can be calculated from density, time, volumetric flow rate. And the volumetric flow rate is linear velocity times the cross-section area. So if this velocity is in R component at location one, which is inside, the area is supposed to be area one. Mass out is supposed to be rho VR2, area two, all right? This area, in this case, it would be spherical shell. That would be four pi R square. This R would be KR. On the other hand, this area two would be four pi r square, but r here would be capital R. And you see that the area two would be larger than area one. Density remains the same, therefore velocity cannot be the same. 
if velocity vr1 and vr2 are not the same, it means that it is function of r. The further away from the center, the slower the linear velocity to keep mass ratio or mass flow rate to be constant. All right? On the other hand, the velocity vr does not change with angle. It goes from the center away to the circumference. It does not change with any angle at all. So it is not function of theta or phi. So if I start with equation of continuity in spherical coordinate, This is equation continuity for spherical coordinate. It is a little bit complicated because we have sine here, okay? But it uh, doesn't matter. The way we do it would be the same. We just eliminate term that are zero. Steady state term will be dropped. Vr is not zero, and Vr is function of r. So this term must be kept. V theta, on the other hand, is zero, and V phi is zero, okay? So what we have from this equation of continuity, it doesn't matter whether the system is isothermal or non-isothermal. As long as you have mass flow going in and out and the component is overall component that you are doing the balance, the mass will always conserve. So this one can always be used. So from this equation, I get one over R squared. Total differentiation now because VR is function of R only. that is equal to zero. If I call this equation equation one, if I integrate this part, this one over r squared will be gone because the right hand side is zero. After integration, I get rho r squared vr equal to some constant. Okay? If I define, if I let wr to be what we call radial mass flow rate. By definition, mass flow rate, just like I, what I erased on that board, it would be linear velocity times the area perpendicular to that velocity which is 4 pi r squared. So this combination turns to be volumetric flow rate. If you multiply by density, it turns to be mass flow rate. All right. So if you look closely, you see that this part and that part are closely related. According to this definition of radio mass flow rate, if I rearrange the equation to get rho r squared vr, you have rho r squared vr. That would equal to wr over 4 pi. And if you take a look at this part, you see that these are the same. That means wr over 4 pi will be constant. In, in the other word, it means that wr itself is constant. Of course, according to common sense, this is constant steady state system, so mass flow is supposed to be fixed, supposed to be constant. We do not have disappearance of mass. We cannot generate mass. Mass flow is supposed to be constant, okay? Then, I'm going to move on and starting with 
Navier Stokes equation. Why? Why do I do that? Why do I start with momentum first? Why don't I start with energy first? Because in this circumstance, I can assume density and viscosity is not affected by temperature. If I can do such assumption, then you can start calculating momentum without worrying about energy at all. Okay? So if I assume density and viscosity to be constant, I can use Navier-Stokes equation. So from Navier-Stokes equation, of course, there will be R component, theta component, and phi component. Okay? In this, in this case, if you analyze further, we have only VR, R component, and VR should give you R momentum. If we have R momentum, the equation relating to R momentum is supposed to be R component of Navier-Stokes equation. But if you're not sure, you can do all, com all three components and just drop terms that are zero, and you will see that some equations are not quite useful at all. Okay? So for R component of Navier-Stokes equation, it looks like this. And I would take some time to write the equation. Maybe I can go over to this board. All right, this is equation for our component of Navier-Stokes equation. So, steady state assumption, Vr is not zero, and Vr is function of R. This term must be kept. V theta is zero, V phi is zero, theta here is zero, and V phi is zero. Okay, so on the left-hand side, I have rho Vr, dVr by dr equal to, oh, pressure with respect to r. Pressure term, does pressure change with respect to r? In your imagine, in your imagine you should see that pressure inside, you have air closer together, 
and air expanded outside, pressure should not be the same, actually. Pressure inside is supposed to be larger than pressure outside. But if you're not sure, keep that in mind, or keep this term anyway, so it have pressure with respect to R. Then, VR is not zero. This term must be kept. 1 over r square, d square by dr square, r square vr. All right? Then, vr is not function of theta. The whole term here is supposed to be 0. And vr is not function of phi as well. So this term will be 0. And if we say that air is not affected by gravity that much, gravity effects can be neglected. So the equation for Navier-Stokes equation would be this part. And I'm going to call this one equation two. OK? And if you repeat the, the process for say the components and phi component, you will not get anything else except that pressure is not function of theta and pressure is not function of phi. OK? So I can erase this part. Now from the first equation that we got from mass balance, if I said that density is assumed to be constant, I can take the density out. OK, so if I start with this, d by dr rho r square vr equal to zero as the equation from mass balance or equation from equation of continuity. If I say density is constant, even though it is gas, I can assume that pressure does not change very much. Density does not change significantly. I can take it out. Okay. Then I'm going to take differentiation to get second order differentiation with respect to R. Why do I do that? Because if you see rho here going out, inside will be r square vr. This term is essentially this term. They are exactly the same. And you see that according to this equation, if you differentiate it, it will remain 0 anyway. OK? So that means. This term in navier stokes equation can be neglected. All right? That makes your, your equation much more simpler. So in this case, I can now write equation to be ordinary differential equation dvr by dr equal to minus dp by dr. OK. Now, from this part, this is definition of radial mass flow rate, OK? If I rearrange this a little bit, I can get VR by itself equal to WR over 4 pi rho r square. This is nothing, just rearrange the definition of radial mass flow rate to get linear velocity. And if you take differentiation, you get dVr or take differentiation dVr that should give you, this is r to the power of minus 2. Differentiated, you get minus wr, which is constant. We found earlier that wr is constant. So this is constant, 4 pi is constant, density is assumed constant. 
inside here, you get, oh, you take two over here, that would cancel to get two, and then r cubed dr. Okay? So from this, you see that if I take a look at equation from near we stoke equation, I can get dvr from this part. I can get vr from this part. Okay? So if I do that, I can solve equation. So from that part, I get rho vr, which is wr over 4 pi rho r squared, times dvr, which is minus wr over 2 pi rho r cubed dr. Please note that this dr and this dr cancel out. Okay. On the right hand side, you get minus dp. From this equation, I do not want to go further. Again, it is mathematical problems. The point is, wr is constant, density is constant, everything else on the left hand side is function of r. Basically, you just do integration with respect to r. Right hand side is pressure. If you do integration, you get pressure. So if you integrate this equation, you will get pressure profile, the change in pressure with respect to the radius. OK? Now, once we're done with momentum, the rest is energy. For equation of energy, Okay, this is again the equation of energy, but in spherical coordinate. Now, eliminate terms that are not zero, that are zero, I'm sorry. Steady state term, VR is not zero. Temperature, in this case, if you analyze the temperature, you see that temperature would be a function of R for sure. You have temperature inside to be TK, temperature outside to be T1, it depends on R. But it does not change with respect to either angle, either vertical or horizontal angle. So it is function of R only. So this term must be kept. This term, on the other hand, temperature is not function of theta. You can drop that, or you can also say that V theta is zero. 
Okay, V phi is also zero, and temperature is not function of phi. This term can be dropped. So on the left hand side, you get rho Cp Vr dt by dr. On the right hand side, this term, temperature depends on R. This term must be kept. This term, temperature is not function of theta. You can drop. And it is not function of phi. You can drop that. You can also say that velocity is not so large. The viscous heat is negligible. This term can be dropped. So what we have left on the right hand side would equal to K over R squared. You can change this to total differentiation because temperature is function of R only. D by dr, r squared, dt by dr. Okay. However, in this case, we realize that Vr can be calculated from mass flow rate equal to 4 pi rho r squared. So basically, you have temperature on both sides, right? In order to solve this equation, is you, you, you need calculus trick. If I said that I let u would be r squared dt by dr. In other words, dt by dr is equal to u over r squared. All right? All the density, heat capacity, heat thermal conductivity can be um, summed into one term. Then here you have this term turns to be du by dr. And this term turns to be u over r squared. An equation would be more simpler, and you, you can use calculus to integrate this equation to get temperature as a function of r. That would be your answer for temperature profile. All right, I, again, I do not want to go further because this is uh, kind of math problems, all right? So for today, I gave you three examples. Each example contains momentum transport as well as energy transport. I show you how to deal with them case by case. I also show you equation of energy for all the coordinate, rectangular coordinate, spherical coordinate, cylindrical coordinate, okay? Most of them, we neglect this term, but you can always deal with that if you know this uh, function, all right? So that's the end of chapter 11. Next time, it will be chapter 12, that, uh, I'm sorry, chapter 14, that would be about interface heat transfer, how can we connect microscopic energy balance to macroscopic energy balance in the same manner as what we did in momentum, all right? So, see you next time.